All right. We'll start. All right. So our next speaker is Chris For Folland. He is from the Met office. And uh, yeah, I mean, he made so much in the uh, development of the um, the model, which um, very famous one at UK. So please. Okay. All ready to go. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, I, this talk is uh, not about the whole of my career, as in Mac Michael McIntyre's case, but it does cover about. At the background to about a quarter of it. Uh, my background is in observations, uh, interannual to decadal variability and uh, modeling, and also in this, uh, in monthly to interannual forecasting. And what I'm really talking about today is something that brings all these things together in the context of interannual forecasting. And this particular project was started off by. Uh, a special request from our Department of the Environment back in 1999 to see whether it was possible to forecast for the coming year global mean temperature as a background to negotiations for the Conference of the Parties or the Greenhouse Gas Convention which take place every year and particularly when uh, the uh, temperature was likely to be particularly high uh, there's obviously increased interest in uh, whether we could forecast that. So I'm going to talk about the global temperature data sets, which I've been much involved with, of course. Um, I, I, and I should concentrate very much on a, an observational technique for making these forecasts. But the forecasts are also made using the Met Office's decadal forecasting model nowadays, though this was not the case in the early years, and some conclusions and future improvements. So first of all, I'm going to talk about simulating global mean surface land and ocean temperature. That's land and ocean together. And uh, this bit is not any surprise to anybody. Uh, what we're using here are the combined greenhouse gases and anthropogenic aerosols. Nowadays, uh, the, what's used by IPCC AR5, and we, we've chosen the uh, uh, RCP 8.5 data set for this particular piece of work, though other versions could be chosen. A new volcanic aerosol data set that's just been published. It's an update and an improvement of the SARTO data set. Lean's 2009 radiation, solar radiation data, total solar radiation, which has less variability in the early part of the century than earlier data sets. An ENSO index, which is actually an EOF, but it could be NINO 3.4, it's very similar. And also an index of the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, which I'll talk about a bit more. Now, in order to look at the influence of forcing factors on something like surface climate, it's not enough really just to look at the raw forcing factors. You have to think of the response of, those, of the surface to the forcing factors. So we have assumed an e-folding time of four years for greenhouse gases and aerosol forcing. This comes from a paper by Held in Journal of Climate 2010. It's quite a controversial area as to how to deal with this time scale, which could be, you could ask questions about that. The solar, I am very doubtful about. I heard yesterday it might be two years from the latest modeling studies. We've assumed four years, but that could easily be changed. We've calculated an e-folding time for eight months for volcanic cooling. We know that should be more rapid because when vol major volcanoes go off, they destabilize the surface layers of the ocean. So there should be a more rapid response. ENSO variability is assumed to lead global surface temperature by four months. This is based on a paper by Trendberth many years ago. And we have used the unfiltered AMO index as well. Uh, these are the indices. Um, we start off with the uh, anthropogenic aerosols, GA as I call it on the top left hand side. Uh, then ENSO, uh, volcanic forcing. There's nothing surprising about any of... Oh sorry, there's nothing, there's nothing surprising about any of these uh, 
of its time series. Uh, notice that the RCP 8.5 anthropogenic aerosol and greenhouse gas series shows a bit of a reduction in the rate of falsing in the late 1990s, which of course with the e-folding time would propagate itself into the early 2000s. So I'll come to that. Notice the AMO index is unfiltered. This is very much the index of almost interhemispheric variability that was discussed not recent, quite recently by Thompson et al., though it's actually based on a slightly different calculation. Now, when you, what we've done is to do uh, multiple regression, but I'm afraid most of the work that's been done in multiple regression on this subject is actually biased. Uh, you cannot fit multiple predictors in, in, into multiple regressions without doing some little tricks. The, the results are biased and the skill is overestimated. So we've used a technique called cross-validation, or otherwise known as the jackknife technique. Uh, and what this does, we, we omit the, the target year, and in order to overcome the problems of persistence, that short-term persistence, we, uh, we, we take away the eight years on either side of the target year. At the beginning of the series, it's an, a, a one-sided eight year. This produces 120 target years and 120 reconstruction equations. This allows us to estimate uncertainty, so we get a double whammy from this. Not only do we remove the bias, but we get uncertainty estimates. And so we get the 120 regression coefficients for each predictor for each year and for the unexplained residuals. And this is the kind of result that we get for Hadcrew T3. Uh, what, we, what I'm showing here in, 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 in the different colors is the 95% confidence limit. So you see it's very, very low uh, for the whole series. But if you look at the, the, these blown up scales, the AMO, quite a lot of uncertainty in the middle part of the century. And notice the solar. It's, it's, it's quite, it's, it's, the uncertainty is quite low in the last 50 years, but it's higher early in the century because of the collinearity between solar and, uh, and, uh, and greenhouse gases. That's the problem. Uh, but at least this net technique actually shows this up explicitly and you can allow for it. The residuals are nearly white noise except here in the Second World War period where we know there are problems with the data and also, and I'll come on to this at the end of the talk, there are problems in Hadcrew T3 due to biases in sea surface temperature. This is the AMO from had crew T3, the NCDC data set and the NASA GIST data set. And you can see that this is, its, this is the effect of the AMO on global surface temperature. And you can see this, there is an effect. This is highly statistically significant. And if you do a regression fits to the falling region and the rising region, using a special technique that allows for the uncertainties in each of these values, uh, these are highly significant. So it looks as if the AMO played a role in the cessation or even re 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 reversal of warming in the middle part of the century. It's not just aerosols. There is an AMO effect. And we know that the AMO has an effect on global temperature from various modeling studies, some of which we've done ourselves, but not only us. Come on to real-time forecasts. Um, most of the ones I'm going to talk about are slightly differently constructed because it was all done many years ago, starting in 1999. We have a fixed year one delay for greenhouse gases. ENSO variability has to be assessed in the previous year, of course. It can't be assessed in, during the year, so there is some loss of skill. We used a filtered AMO index rather than an unfiltered one, which we now regard as suboptimal. Uh, we also used a, a technique of predicting ENSO using the Met Office's seasonal forecasting model called Glossy. Uh, and we now use the decadal forecasting model also to make these predictions. And all the assessments were made against a contemporary version of Hadcrew T because the statistical methods were fitted to those methods. And this is the bottom line of the whole talk. This is what we've actually been able to achieve over the last uh, 11 years, 2000 to 2010. And you can see the correlation between the observations and the forecasts is 0.74. The root mean squared error is 0.07, which is a, a fairly low value when you compare that with the uncertainty in the data. However, there is a bias of uh, about 0.06 of a degree centigrade. 
that's just statistically significant. And you can see the red line, which is the forecasts, the, uh, is, tends to be above the black line, which is the observations. So why does that happen? Well, before going on to why does that happen, I just want to point out that you can use this kind of study as an informal attribution study. This is the, the, what I'm looking at here are decadal trends, and you can see that what this suggests is that there has been a bit of a slowing in decadal trends in the early part of the 2000s due to, greenhouse, due to that slowing of the rate of increase of the combination of greenhouse gases and aerosols. That was increased aerosols. That is based on the RCP 8.5 data set. And you can also deduce from this solar contribution, something again is not surprising, that some of the slowing of global warming has been due to solar. And we have obviously picked this up. Now, if we replace those forecasts with some of the improvements that we've made in those simulations I've told you about, and also replace had crew T3, which is somewhat biased, and I will prove that in a minute, with the average of had crew T3 uh, uh, NCDC and GIS, that's the black curve, uh, you get even higher skill. So the forecasts are now, at the moment, are being made for the average of these three data sets. Um, sorry, a bit, this got out of order. Um, the, the, the cause of the bias is due to the fact that we've, these orange stations are now missing from the had crew T3 data set. Uh, but in the had crew T4 data set, which has now gone off to publication, uh, there are many, many more stations in this region. And this increases the warming in the Arctic relative to had crew T3. So we've, we've been losing uh, some, some of that warming. And you can see from this picture from the 20th century reanalysis, era interim shows the same, uh, that, the, that this warming has, uh, has, has actually occurred. So if I go on to... Uh, uh, the, the 2011 forecast. This is now for the average of the three data sets. The uh, observed anomaly to September was 0.41. Actually, it's 0.41 now to October, and the forecasts are pretty close. That's the dynamical forecast method. That's the statistical. And finally, I'll go on to my conclusions. These forcing factors explain most of the interannual to century variability of global mean temperature. Each is highly statistically significant. The AMO almost certainly has an effect, as originally suggested by Schlesinger and Raman Cutty. Real-time prediction skill is pretty close to that expected from the simulations, though it's slightly lower because we don't perfectly know some of the data, particularly ENSO, when we do the forecasts in the previous November or December. The war, there was a, a, a small warm bias in the forecasts. Uh, a little bit of it was due to a, a, a statistical problem, but it is now, we think, gone. And the forecasts for 2011 and 12 are for the average of the three data sets. Thank you very much. We will take a question. Yes, please. Sorry, what? What, what, is, what date of the previous year you bought in the forecast? Uh, normally, we make the forecast uh, in mid-December. Can I comment on that? Yeah. yeah. I was going to ask the same question, and um, thinking that if you were to start in April or May for the year, you'd do far better, because uh, and so having no predictability across springtime. Uh, well, this is not, uh, th now this is a crucial point. There is skill from ENSO because there is a delay in the effect of ENSO on global surface temperature. And this was studied particularly by Trendberth and many others. It varies between three and six months. We actually assume in our technique it's four months. So although there is a spring predictability barrier, there is still a substantial amount of predictability of the influence of ENSO on global surface temperature. Well done. Yes, good, good answer. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Can you leave the... Oh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
know how to play it. PGF. Okay. All right, and then I think you can do as usual. Okay. Uh, I want to uh, describe for you some uh, characteristics of wa water vapor as a climate feedback and uh, as a possible forcing of climate. Uh, uh, there's going to be a lot of words on these, uh, in the, on these slides. Uh, uh, th that's meant for the uh, people who are fast readers in the audience. And, uh, uh, okay. and possibly for those who uh, want to take a closer look at this stuff uh, later on. Uh, I'm a slow reader, so I'll just skip over the words. Uh, uh, basically, the uh, surface temperature of the Earth is... Uh, uh, established as a result of uh, energy balance between solar radiation and uh, thermal uh, rad outgoing radiation. Uh, uh, this is, uh, nominally this is, uh, amounts to 240 watts of solar radiation that's absorbed as a global average and uh, same, same amount being emitted to space. Uh, the, um, uh, this amounts to black body temperature, radiant temperature of 255 Kelvin, and that would be the surface temperature of the Earth if there were no greenhouse effect. Uh, the greenhouse effect uh, happens uh, because there's absorbing gases in the atmosphere. They absorb the uh, upgoing uh, radiation, and then they have to re-emit uh, half the radiation going up and half the radiation going back down, and this downwelling radiation is what gives you additional warming to uh, increase the surface temperature above what the black body temperature would be, uh, giving you 288 Kelvin. Uh, the difference is a greenhouse effect, and that can be also expressed in terms of uh, uh, flux quantity as uh, amounting to 150 uh, watts per square meter. Uh, this is entirely radiative uh, effect and it's determined completely by uh, the atmospheric temperature profile, the surface temperature, uh, and the distribution of the uh, atmospheric gases and, uh, and the clouds. Um, since it's radiation, uh, we can uh, take, it, uh, uh, you know, take it apart uh, piece by piece and uh, put it back together again. Uh, for this particular case, uh, we ran the, uh, uh, the climate model for a year of uh, accumulated hourly diagnostics, and uh, then uh, put them back into the, over the uh, surface radiation at 393 Kelvin, and uh, to, uh, check the difference. So the water vapor by itself uh, it reduces the flux by this much, uh, clouds by that much, uh, CO2 by that much, and so on for the others. And then we can uh, also uh, uh, take uh, the gases out one by one, uh, and uh, get a similar effect. Now, if you add all these up, we get 206 watts here and 112 watts there. Uh, the real number should be 152, and so that uh, happens because of the uh, overlapping absorption. So we rescale all these and uh, get the numbers that uh, water vapor accounts for about 50% of the uh, greenhouse effect, uh, clouds about 25%, CO2 about 20%, and then the uh, trace gases and aerosols, about uh, five watts in there. Now, we can group these into two categories, either as feedbacks or as forcings. So now, what, what exactly is the difference between a radio uh, forcing and a feedback? Uh, basically, a forcing is something that you put in the atmosphere that does absorption that stays there all on its uh, own account, uh, does not uh, uh, condense or precipitate, so like the greenhouse gases, CO2, and the uh, methane, et cetera. Uh, a feedback, on the other hand, is something that uh, uh, cannot stay in the atmosphere uh, on its own uh, 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 account. Uh, it has to be, uh, it depends on the local meteorology. So this is where water vapor and clouds uh, are considered f uh, feedback effects. Now, uh, the natural question arises, what happens if you uh, take away the forcings? What happens to the feedbacks? Uh, we did that. Uh, 
And uh, that resulted in a science paper about a year ago. And the conclusion of the paper was that the atmospheric CO2 is the principal uh, control knob governing the Earth's uh, surface temperature. Uh, the non-condensing greenhouse gases, CO2 and uh, N2O, methane, uh, they account for 25% of the total greenhouse effect. And 75% comes from water vapor and for clouds. And now if you zero out the uh, greenhouse gases, the forcings, uh, this should uh, plunge the Earth into an ice age uh, type of a climate. And uh, this is what happened. Uh, this is a latitude time plot of the surface uh, temperature of the Earth uh, as it's uh, cooling, uh, cooling down to an uh, ice age uh, or, or to an ice ball type of a climate. Uh, it happens pretty quickly. After 50 years, there's only a narrow sliver of the, uh, uh, around the tropics that's uh, still at a temperature of about one, uh, one degree Celsius. Uh, at this point, though, uh, the uh, uh, thickness of the, uh, of the sea ice increased to the point where the ice hit the ocean bottom, and this freaked out the uh, uh, energy transport routine uh, uh, in there, and so that bombed the model, model at that point. A more quantitative look at the changes that took place is shown in this line plot. These are the global uh, uh, average quantities of the surface temperature decreased from about 15 Celsius down to uh, minus 20. Uh, clouds increased, uh, the sea ice increased greatly, and planetary albedo increased greatly. Uh, water vapor decreased from a 100% level down to a 10% level. Now, I might ask a question, uh, why, uh, why didn't the water vapor and clouds go to zero when you zero out out the, uh, the uh, radiative forcings. Well, you have to remember that um, uh, solar radiation is also there. And uh, uh, 240 watts of solar radiation is what gets you from uh, zero degrees uh, Kelvin uh, surface temperature all the way up to 255 degrees Kelvin. Uh, but 255 Kelvin, according to clausius clapper relation is still too damn cold to give you, uh, to maintain much of a water vapor amount into the atmosphere. So you need the extra 40 watts or so from uh, coming from uh, CO2 and the non-condensing minor gases to get you to the point where you have enough water vapor feedbacks kicking in to get you to all the way to the you know, current 288 Kelvin that we have in the atmosphere. Uh, here we wanted to examine more closely the uh, 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 or quantify the, uh, the time response of, uh, of the water vapor feedbacks. Uh, we did this by uh, two runs where we doubled the, uh, did an instantaneous doubling of the water vapor and an instantaneous zeroing out of the water vapor and then let their model run. As you can see, in uh, about 10, 20 days, uh, this is the bottom, uh, bottom atmosphere, this is the middle troposphere, uh, the water appears pretty much back up to uh, it's uh, uh, control run equilibrium values. Uh, on the right there are the corresponding changes in the long wave fluxes. You see an immediate increase in the uh, uh, outgoing long wave flux at the top of the atmosphere when you zero out the water vapor, about, about 50 watts or so. Uh, when you double the water vapor, there's a decrease in the water vapor. And again, in about 10 days or so, we're back to normal. At the bottom in their kind of expanded uh, scale is the uh, uh, upwelling flux from the surface. Uh, what you see there prominently is a diurnal uh, effect of the global average temperature. That's because uh, you have the, uh, uh, the asymmetry in the land-ocean distribution that's uh, causing you that. Uh, but there you see uh, maybe a five watt chain, uh, fluctuation and uh, corresponding to maybe a degree or two change at the surface. Uh, if we take the difference between these two plots, maybe this shows up a little more clearly as a change in the uh, greenhouse effect. Uh, or again, you see that it's back to normal about 10 days. Uh, when you double the water vapor, uh, there's a sharp drop because the uh, climate system does not tolerate uh, uh, relative humidities uh, much above 100%. Uh, percent. Uh, when you zero out the water vapor, it takes uh, you know, five, ten, 10 days for the water vapor to uh, get mixed up vertically in the atmosphere and horizontally in there. So water vapor is a feedback in there that's uh, very fast acting in a matter of, uh, you know, 10 days, it's back to normal. Uh, 
Uh, this uh, uh, shows a change in the greenhouse effect uh, that uh, uh, since uh, 1850. Uh, the greenhouse effect has increased by about six watts since then. Uh, the, this represents uh, some uh, uh, climate runs at, uh, with a GIST uh, uh, coupled atmosphere ocean model uh, with a 3D ocean in there that were run for the uh, IPCC AR5 uh, report. Uh, this represents a five run uh, uh, ensemble average. Uh, what you see, uh, the fluctuations, those are the ENSO type uh, internal, uh, interannual variability. Uh, the arrows indicate points where you have uh, volcanoes going off, and uh, uh, volcano, uh, the thermal effect of volcano should increase the, the greenhouse effect, but uh, uh, the solar decrease in the, in the uh, illumination is uh, more than offsetting. It, it decreases surface temperature and decreases water vapor. That's why you see dips in the greenhouse effect occurring where you have these major volcanoes going on. Uh, it's interesting to uh, take a look uh, at a global map of the greenhouse effect. Uh, you can see that the pattern uh, doesn't change much over the 150 years from uh, 1850 to year 2000. Uh, there's been a six watt increase in there. Uh, but there's a bigger seasonal change. This is a northern uh, hemisphere winter uh, to uh, a larger value, about a 12 watt increase going into the summer. Uh, in particular, uh, you can take a look at, uh, you know, over Africa, there's a big change uh, there and uh, maybe 100 watts worth and also Australia. Uh, the uh, Background greenhouse gases, of course, are uh, fairly uniform latitudinally, but you have a uh, latitudinal change in the solar forcing with the uh, seasons, and that's what's giving you this shift in the, uh, uh, in the greenhouse strength pattern. Uh, mostly, wherever you have high temperatures and high clouds, that's where you're going to have the, the biggest greenhouse effect, and that may be up to 270 or so watts per square meter. Uh, you also have regions in the uh, 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 wintertime and Ar Arctic, Antarctic, uh, where you have a negative uh, greenhouse effect because the uh, uh, atmospheric temp rating temperature is higher than what the surface temperature actually is. Uh, these are the basic conclusions in there that uh, 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 the, um, it is the solar radiation and the con non-condensing greenhouse gases that uh, provide the support structure for the, uh, for the atmosphere in there. And uh, uh, water vapor is a feedback, uh, a, a fast feedback that accounts for like 75% of the effect. And that the, uh, uh, and, and here, here's where it can be a forcing that uh, uh, changes from e uh, away from equilibrium, they occur all the time in the climate system, uh, but they only provide kind of a transient, uh, uh, virtual forcings, which do not contribute to the long way uh, to the any long-term trend. So all these effects are, uh, uh, I think, uh, self-evident to those who are working in the climate system. Uh, the real problem is getting all this information into Fox News so that they can inform the uh, their uh, audience of uh, uh, climate contrarians as to what's really going on with the climate system. Uh, thank you for your attention. Um, we have time for one question. Any questions? Yes, please. <laughs> I think that's the case. Uh, uh, People who work in climate, they understand these things or have understood it for many years, and it's just trying to keep clarifying it uh, over and over again until it finally sinks in. Maybe even Fox News will notice it at some point. <laughs> Um, our next speaker is uh, Thomas Eckerman, uh, again an old friend. Tom was a uh, graduate student when I was in the faculty at University of Washington. Let's hang him. Oh, and um, uh, 
Then Tom went to Australia, where we crossed uh, paths for a while. Then he became the uh, chief scientist of the ARM program. And uh, if one looks at the ARM program and the uh, great uh, observing system that has been set up over the decades, uh, Tom is mainly responsible for that. He now is a professor at the University of Washington, back to his uh, alma mater. Uh, and also, he's uh, the, the um, director of JASAO, which is a uh, um, NOAA Cooperative Institute. Tom. Mm -hmm. Just start it. Okay. No, it's in there. Oh. Right. Well, Peter already stole part of my punchline. Um, it's a real honor to be here. It's a real honor to be a fellow of the AGU. The very first presentation I ever gave in a scientific meeting was at the AGU annual fall meeting back up in the hill um, in the old hotel. I went to that meeting in the company of my thesis advisor because I was a graduate student, Conway Leovi, and this other young professor from the University of Washington named Peter Webster. Um, Peter has had a large influence on my career, mostly positive. <laughs> It's a real honor, as I said, to be here. Um, there's a lot of the credit for being here that goes to my colleagues and the students um, that I've worked with over the years who have contributed so much to my own knowledge, my research, um, and to the genuine pleasure of being a scientist and working in this field. So I don't have time to acknowledge all of them. I hope that uh, those of you who are here know who I'm talking about. And again, um, I could do the Michael McIntyre thing and talk for you know half an hour about uh, all the things I've learned in my career, Michael, but I'm going to just focus on what I've learned most recently. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit about some work that we're doing using synoptic classification to try and understand cloud parameterizations. I want to acknowledge particularly Stuart Evans, Roger Marchand, and Nat Begley, uh, without whom I would not have done this work or been able to do this work, and the research funding which we've received from DOE over the years. The motivation for this work arose out of trying to understand how we might use ARM data, data from single ground, source, uh, single ground locations, to look at cloud parameterizations. And basically, we set out to try and separate the influence of dynamics um, and of cloud parameterizations in models by classifying dynamical patterns in the atmosphere and then looking at the clouds associated with those dynamical patterns, then asking whether we can carry out the same logic for a climate model, thereby isolating the same sets of dynamical patterns, asking whether the clouds that are produced in the climate model then look like the clouds that are produced in the real world. Our methodology is to take a time series of regional synoptic uh, snapshots, cluster them using a neural net algorithm, all of which is pretty simple. It's the next step which gets to be really difficult, which is to figure out whether you have a robust set of clusters and how would you know. So to give you an example of how we do this, um, I'm going to use Darwin, Australia. We use Darwin because there's a cloud radar there, and I'm going to explain how we use the cloud radar data. So we collect um, every uh, three, uh, three hours a set of data um, on a 9 by 9 horizontal grid, 2 by 2 and a half degree spacing, roughly of temperature, horizontal velocities, relative humidity, and the surface pressure. So each snapshot represents about 2,400, uh, 2,300 variables. Um, we do this for four years, eight times a day, throw it into a computer and ask it to cluster, um, which is only a matter of the computer brain, not ours. So if we then do this, we end up with a set of initial states, which you can see in the little box. And then the fun begins, because what we now do is we go back and we look at the radar profiles of cloud occurrence associated with each one of these snapshots and use those cloud occurrences to ask whether the states that we have found are stable. In other words, if we take the data set we have and subdivide it, do we get the same kinds of cloud profiles associated with the same dynamical patterns? And then we also ask whether they pass a distinctness test. That is, each state should only have, should have a distinct cloud profile. We shouldn't get the same cloud profile for multiple states. 
Um, for those of you who are synoptic meteorologists, uh, this is a poor man's way of being a synoptic meteorologist. I don't know how to do synoptic meteorology despite the best efforts of my teachers at the University of Washington, including Dick Reed. Um, so this is how I can do synoptics. Oh my goodness, uh, Peter. Uh, <laughs> I told you Peter was not the best influence on my career. <laughs> uh, so when we did this at Darwin, we came up with eight states. Darwin is a monsoon um, environment. There are four dry season states. There are two states which are transition states, which you can see by the sort of broken up character and the uh, transition from dr dry to wet and wet to dry, and then two wet season states. If we ask what are the cloud profiles that are associated with each one of these states? You can see them here. The blue, uh, two blue curves are the monsoon uh, season states. The green ones are the transition, and these red ones are the four dry season states. There is a meteorology, average meteorology pattern, which we can associate with each one of these states. Um, I draw your attention just uh, to these two monsoon curves, and you can see that the cloud occurrence profiles look very similar, but in fact, what you see is the cloud occurrence is about twice as high in this state, the deep monsoon, as it is in this, the weak monsoon. And so what we can tell and when we look at the dynamical patterns is this is a very strong westerly component, the very strong deep monsoon. This has an easterly component, and it's the sort of in-between or break um, period of the monsoon. And we could go through and identify each one of these with a meteorology, but we don't actually have the time. I draw your attention to the fact that these two cloud, cloud profiles look very similar. The shading on each one of these cloud profiles represents the significance test of whether they are distinct or not. And in fact, that little separation is enough to show that they are distinct. We can determine the average meteorology. So now that we have these states, what can we do? Well, we can determine the average meteorology of each one of these uh, clusters, which um, I could show you if I had more time. We can answer questions about state evolution, which is actually quite interesting. If you're in state A, what's the probability you're going to go to state B? If you're in state B, what's the probability you're going to go to state A? And what does that tell you about the way the atmosphere behaves? We can talk about the duration of each one of these states. We can then answer also questions about the state properties, so we can go through and create probability distributions of things like uh, precipitation, liquid water content, really anything that we can measure and look at that probability associated with that state. Uh, we can also ask questions about the links between the local scale and the larger scale. For instance, what role does the MGO play in these uh, occurrence of states? I'm only going to show you one example. Um, this is an example of precipitation rate. What we've plotted here is the precipitation rate when it's raining. The fraction of time it's raining is shown here. And I want to draw your attention to these two blue curves, which are the monsoon curves. And you can see that even though there's difference between the two states when it, in terms of cloud occurrence, when it does rain, oh, and, and the amount of time it rains, one's about half the other. But when it rains, the rain rates are very similar. But then you'll notice that there's this curve here, which is the orangish curve. Um, and in that particular case, it only rains about a third of 1% of the time. But notice that when it rains, it really pours. And anybody who's been to Darwin knows this particular state. These are the pre-season convective storms that don't occur very often, but when they do, you might as well be standing out under a hose. <coughs> and you can pull that out of, <coughs> sorry, we can pull that out of our analysis. So let's look briefly at step two. Um, in step two, the idea is now to ask whether or not we can do the same thing in a model. And what I'm going to show you here are some results that Roger Marchand and I and Matt Begley published a couple of years ago using the multi-scale modeling framework. The multi-scale modeling framework or super parameterization is a global grid and in each element of the global grid is running a two-dimensional cloud resolving model. So it's basically a way of running 8,000 cloud resolving models coupled together by a large grid. Um, we carried out this comparison at the ARM Southern Great Plains site using a two-year data set uh, from the NOAA RUC model and the ARM radar. Uh-oh. Ah, there it is. Um, okay, this is the most complicated slide, and I'm sorry the lights are a little uh, high in here, so it may be a little difficult to see. There are two curves on 
each one of these plots. One is blue, and that is the ARM uh, cloud profile. One is red, which is the cloud profile from the MMF. So what we do is we map each one of the, maybe I should go back. Just um, So what we do is we take the states we have, we map the GCM output into those states, so we now get a collection of the same dynamical states in the GCM. We now have an observed cluster and a model cluster. We can now look at the observed cl cloud profile and the model profiles. So here's, in looking at this, you can see that in this panel, for instance, the two curves from the data and the model agree very well. The cloud occurrence profiles are very good. We've applied a statistical test, and the statistical test says if the background is green, those two are statistically indistinguishable. In other words, the clouds which we get in the model are statistically not distinguishable from the clouds that we get in the real world for that dynamical state. So the implication is that the cloud parameterization, and in this case the 2D model, is doing a good job. The yellow one is kind of on the margin of being statistically uh, differentiable, and the red ones are statistically different, in which case it shows that they are not um, this, that the model is not doing a good job. One of the interesting things that came out of this paper, for instance, was that we could look at this and we could tell you that the model was doing a good job when cold fronts went by, but it was doing a lousy job when warm fronts went by. It's overactive, and one of my students talked about that earlier this morning. Um, we can also ask for cloud occurrence by month. So this is a plot of month here and atmospheric state here. This is from the rapid update cycle, uh, this is from the MMF, and this is the difference. And you can see that the states capture the difference between summer and winter, but the frequency occurrence of the states are different. Um, this is something which we don't know exactly why and what it means yet, but we're working on it. So let me wind up by saying where we are with this. Uh, we've completed an analysis for four years of the Darwin data. Uh, Stuart Evans, my student, um, is the first author on a paper which we've submitted to uh, JGR. I talked to one of the reviewers, and it's going well. Um, at the meeting here. It's one of the benefits of being at the AGU. Um, we're currently finishing work on a 14-year um, data set from the Southern Great Plains using ERA Interim. Uh, Stuart has a poster on that tomorrow morning. We're repeating analysis using the uh, NCEP reanalysis to ask whether the reanalysis makes a difference. We hope not. And we're beginning classification of the GFDL AM3 model to look at how it compares with the data. Thank you very much. Um, there may be more, more than one reviewer. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you take what you can get. <laughs> uh, questions, please. All right, sir. Okay, thank you for listening. Great. All right, next with Dr. John Pyle, and we're moving to the chemistry now, from the synoptic metrology, going to the chemistry. Well, thank you very much. It's a, a real pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, let me just, uh, I, I'm going to follow the kind of Michael McIntyre school of, of giving these talks. So it's going to be very wide ranging. Um, it's certainly going to be a little bit introspective when I look back over nearly four decades, which is a bit scary, of, of my work. It's, um, it's certainly self-indulgent, and I hope you will uh, indulge me correspondingly. Just to put what I'm going to say in, in perspective, let me say that uh, what kind of scientist I am, I used to call myself once upon a time an aeronomer, my definition of an aeronomer was somebody who pretended to be an atmospheric chemist when they were talking to meteorologists. 
and vice versa. Um, I, I am, or at least I used to be a modeler. I still run a modeling group. Nobody lets me touch numerical models much these days. But I am very interested in the use of models and data, uh, the use of models and data to understand processes, and in particular, uh, the thing that, that's, that's um, been a theme through my career, I think, is the interaction between atmospheric chemistry and climate. And the first slide here, which goes back to uh, the, early 90, the early 80s, worked, worked with Joanna Haig, was a study with a two-dimensional model in which we looked at what would happen if we added CFCs to the atmosphere. Uh, that's shown over here. So if we increase CFCs, we deplete ozone. If we increase CO2, then the, the, the stratosphere cools, and that slows down the rates of ozone destruction, and we get an increase in ozone. So there's an interesting chemistry-climate interaction. And when you do the double perturbation, you don't get the linear impact of the two. So a, a nice example, a nice early example of chemistry-climate interactions. One of the things that my group has done recently, we've been involved in the development of a chemistry climate model with the Met Office and the University of Leeds. Uh, this shows what happens when you run a scenario in that calculation to look at the recovery of ozone from the effects of, of ozone depleting substances, ODSs, but we're also looking at changes in greenhouse gases. So the model, this is global mean ozone, shows the decline of ozone associated with the rise of ozone depleting substances in, the, in the, the atmosphere, then the impact of the recovery uh, as these ozone depleting substances are removed. And then we get this so-called super recovery of ozone. And that's because of what we saw on the last slide. It's because the stratosphere is cooling, and we, we actually, uh, in this simulation, are ending up with more ozone uh, subsequently. These kind of calculations, I think, are, are, are quite important. Uh, I've done one or two in my career, but frankly, running lots and lots of scenarios, I don't find terribly um, exciting. Similarly, um, I think model into comparisons are very important things. Uh, but again, uh, there's a sort of industry associated with some of this activity, which leaves me slightly uncomfortable. What I like to use models for is to address the issue of processes. And here again is a, is a very old example, work initially with Rod Jones and subsequently with, with Leslie Gray. Rod had been involved in SAMS. This is, we're looking at N2O in the, in the stratosphere. There's the equator. I think this is about 30 kilometers. And what you see at certain times of the year is that there is a distribution with a local minimum in, N, in N2O at the, uh, at, in, in the equator, in the equatorial stratosphere. Whereas the numerical model that we developed, that we saw on the first slide, the 2D model that we had, predicted that there would be ascent in the, in the tropics, and we had much larger concentrations there. So the model failed to capture this, this double peak. But we knew, and this is work I did with Leslie Gray, that the, the model, it was a fairly simplified 2D model, as 2D models are, it didn't capture quite a lot of, of the atmospheric dynamics. So we, uh, we, and in particular, didn't ca capture equatorial dynamics. What we did was we, we, we said, well, let's imagine that, that, that there is a, um, some kind of momentum drive associated with a semi-annual semi, semi oscillation. We prescribed that in a rather simple but interactive way in the calculation. We expected it would induce a circulation uh, at some, some, with some phases with downward motion over the equator, upward motion in the extratropics. When we did that, the model actually captured the semi-annual oscillation, and subsequently, or, or at the same time, we also captured this double peak. So a nice example of a dynamical uh, interaction that, that we were able, a dynamical process that we studied. A variety of chemical processes here, and I'm not going to um, talk about them all, um, but we've studied lots of different chemical processes. Let me just focus on the thing over here, where some work with John Harris. Uh, we used satellite data of water, of NO2, and of nitric acid to derive global fields, insofar as the satellite data was global, of the hydroxyl radical using two different methods. The idea was to see whether we could, uh, whether we could test the theory of, uh, of hydroxyl. The, the model, the, 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 the data shown by these uh, lines over here, 
it was in the, in the range that was calculated, uh, that was measured rather by Jim Anderson. The two different methods agreed quite well, which was internal consistency. And I think the important thing of this, and I think it was the first time it was done, is, and this was very much John Harris's idea, we really looked at how accurately we could do this in terms of the accuracy of the measurements and the accuracy of the, of the chemical data that went into, into the thing. So I think quite a nice example there. Um, as I said, data has been very important to me. I had the privilege during the 1990s of being involved um, in, in helping to coordinate a number of European campaigns to look at, at Arctic ozone depletion, subsequently in mid-latitudes and the tropics. Neil Harris, who's here, Jean-Pierre Pomero, who's here, were, were also very heavily involved in those organizations. This is a front cover from the ESO campaign. And the kind of work that we did um, during the, the, those... Um, uh, th th those, uh, those campaigns led us to an understanding of Pomer ozone uh, b that was contributed by European scientists that I think was actually pretty important. This is some work that I did with, my group did with Martin Chipperfield and after he'd moved to Leeds. Martin was one of my first students, was my first student. Uh, and what we're seeing here is the model with chemistry is capturing this decline in ozone as observed by the ozone sons, um, whereas a model with no chemistry, in other words, purely advected, uh, would give you much higher ozone. There was about 70% of ozone depletion in that particular year, one of a number of years where there's been substantial depletion in the Arctic. Moving on a bit, uh, Neil Harris and I, again, during these, these campaigns, w w w rather uh, were concerned about the lack of any, European, uh, of any UK uh, instruments uh, in these polar campaigns, and we developed a, a GC-based instrument which has actually been deployed on the ground. Now, it was originally built for balloons. It's been deployed on the ground in Southeast Asia. It's, it's GC-based. It measures halocarbons. This is one example from 2008 where we're looking at uh, two different instruments measuring uh, in the rainforest, measuring uh, concentrations of bromophore on the order of one or two parts per trillion. We took one of the instruments to the local coast, we see much higher concentrations consistent with uh, occasionally very local emissions of bromoform, but also of, 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 of coastal uh, source of bromoform. And we've been using this data, as I say, we've been out there, um, the, the, the instruments have been out there for now several years. We've got two and a bit years of quasi-continuous data. Uh, this is C2CL4, which shows an annual cycle uh, which is consistent really with the, the movement of the intertropical convergence zone. We try to use the bromoform data to uh, improve our understanding of bromoform emissions into the atmosphere. So we've done a case study of a relatively short period in 2008, uh, a couple of weeks, when the air was predominantly from uh, this region over the Sulu Sea, from Australia. So this defines the emissions that were contributing to the measured bromoform here in, um, in Borneo. Bromoform has a lifetime of only a couple of weeks. Um, so th these, were, these were back trajectories from our measurements defining where the emission regions were. Matt Ashfone, one of my students who's been working with me and with, with Neil, basically then defined a number of different regions from which he ran forward trajectories, um, uh, some of which went to um, to our measurement sites. So if you run the trajectories forward, you come up with um, a distribution, uh, a concentration distribution at our two sites, which looks like this. Um, it actually captures quite well the observed um, uh, structure uh, in terms of the PDFs. And we were able then to scale the emissions along the trajectories to, to, to match the observation. So we came up with new estimates of emissions, which are considerably better, we think, than the Nicola Warwick et al. emissions uh, that she derived about half a dozen years ago. Finally, uh, let me mention something we've been doing on, uh, on isoprene. Isoprene is an important biogenic emission into the atmosphere. It's emitted from, uh, from a, a variety of, 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 of biospheric sources, trees of various kinds. And we've looked at what would happen were you to change, um, change some tropical, uh, tropical land use change, in particular if you went from um, a tropics which was dominated by rainforest to a tropics in which you were dominated by agriculture. And if you do that, 
then if you go from rainforest to agriculture, then the isoprene emissions into the atmosphere decrease. Given that there's very little NOx there, a de that, that decrease actually leads to an increase in ozone. And what we're seeing here is the number of days in the year over which uh, an eight-hour ozone of 35 parts per billion is exceeded. So this is the extra days that you get when you do that land use change. And it's about somewhere between 30 and 60. And the point is, of course, that ozone damages crops. So high ozone, this is a, some kind of crop damage threshold. That high ozone could damage the crops, the very crops that you're trying to grow. So another interesting feedback. Um, OK, well, I, I, I've had, um, like, I'm sure everybody else standing here, a really enjoyable time as a, as a scientist. It's, it, it has been, been great fun. Um, huge thanks to a very wide uh, number of, of, of colleagues in the community, but especially, of course, to the people that I've worked with uh, at my various institutions in Oxford, at the Rutherford uh, Appleton Laboratory, and in Cambridge. And thank you for listening to me. We have a minute for the questions. So, any questions? I have a question. We know what we need for the uh, chemical models to reproduce do the good job for, the, for simulation the chemical species, like long-lived long species. So we need to have good dynamics, good winds. But is it any minimum chemistry exists so we can um, incorporate in the general circulation models? Or because chemistry is so complicated, so do we have a minimum chemistry? It's... Um I think we understand, certainly we understand very well the chemistry that we need to put into, into stratospheric models. Uh, in terms of tropospheric models then, I guess the real question is, what's the problem that you're interested in? If you're interested largely in, uh, in the control of greenhouse gases, then you can probably get away with some minimum set. If you're interested in air quality, then of course the, the, the chemistry becomes uh, much more complicated. I mentioned isoprene um, at the very end of my talk, and there's a lot of interest in isoprene mechanisms at the moment. So that's a, a, a particular area of, of uh, you know, where, where there's, there's very active area of research at the moment in, in trying to understand precisely what's going on. So um, developing very simple models which, which satisfy chemists is, uh, is a challenge. I do have a request because um, uh, the speakers and certainly the uh, uh, two chairs here don't bite and the, the, the very expensive seats at the front are almost empty and you, uh, if we're not careful a fire marshal will come in and lock the doors because they don't like people hanging around and uh, so if you don't like big government come down and sit in the front. Hmm? Our next speaker is a very famous scientist and an old friend of mine, uh, Bill Cotton from uh, Colorado State University. He's been there a long, long time and uh, has done seminal work in, in uh, uh, mesoscale modeling, clouds, aerosols, and so yeah. on, and has had many, many distinguished students and done great science. So, Bill. Well, thank you, Peter. Let me see how. Okay. Um, it's been an exciting morning for me. First of all, I have never had two talks back to back, 10 minutes from the, each other in different rooms. So I was rushing over here, but unfortunately they're just across the hall from each other. And the other thing is, of course, I'm trying to overview my research in aerosol related impacts for over 40 years of a career in 15 minutes, which gets to be a little challenging too. So I'm gonna talk about my early career where the focus was on ice nuclei uh, then I basically spent 20, well, actually, uh, right up through the current, looking, focusing more on basic research of mesoscale convective system and severe storms. And along with the interest in uh, global climate, uh, then I, uh, uh, I got involved in looking at uh, aerosol impacts, mainly CCN or cloud condensation nuclei on cl clouds and that. 
Uh, anyway, at the time that I was a graduate student in the late 60s, uh, cloud seeding was king. I mean, if you wanted to do research on clouds and aerosols and that, you basically did it with justifying it that you're, uh, the impacts on weather modification or cloud seeding and that. So uh, basically what I studied in my dissertation was run a very simple cloud model by today's standards, a Lagrangian parcel type of, and training Lagrangian parcel model uh, in which uh, varied the concentrations of ice nuclei to look at their impacts on the potential for dynamic enhancement of the clouds and, and uh, result in increase in precipitation. Uh, this work was done at Penn State and then followed up when I worked for Joanne Simpson at the former Experimental Meteorology Laboratory in, in Miami. And uh, basically, uh, oh, that's not, the, the, one of the interesting things about that, there, is, there was some implications about uh, how CCN could also influence the clouds because I found that the uh, rapidity of glaciation of cloud, how fast the cloud is converted from liquid cloud to ice, was dependent on the concentrations of drizzle droplets and rain, super cool uh, rain droplets and that. And that in turn was influenced by the concentrations of CCN. So if you had high concentrations of CCN, uh, it suppressed the drizzle formation process and formation of super cool rain droplets and that. And as a result, the rapidity of glaciation of a cloud is a lot slower than if the cloud were very clean, low on CCN concentrations and that. And the, the implication was that the clouds that are more maritime or clean at air mass uh, convective clouds were more responsive to cloud seeding than if they were highly polluted in that. Well then, uh, so, so uh, that was the basic point here. Uh, and. Uh, then, then the demise of weather modification research took place and I shifted my whole focus after that to looking at basic research on convective storms and mesoscale convective systems and that. And uh, not much attention on aerosol effects. Well then climate change came around along and everybody got interested in, well now, how do aerosols affect the climate change and that, uh, particularly from the point of view of uh, how uh, increased pollution aerosols might affect the albedo of the clouds, the so-called Tumi effect, and extensions of it by Bruce Albright and that. And uh, so begin, beginning in the uh, 1990s, uh, we began more related research to how CCN, cloud condensation nuclei, might affect clouds. And this work was done in collaboration with, uh, hmm, I, can't, I can't find my pointer even, uh, Graham Feingold, Bjorn Stevens, Hongli Zhang, and more recently, uh, Will Chang and that. What that research s suggests is that for relatively simple dynamical clouds, marine strata cumulus clouds and that, uh, the response was really quite nonlinear and didn't follow along with the idea that if you increase CCN concentrations, it would reduce, suppress the warm rain or drizzle formation process and that, lead to wetter clouds and clouds over longer lifetimes and, and that. Uh, one example is if you have a cloud, a cloud in which drizzle settles partly through the way through, through the boundary layer uh, before it evaporates, then what you have is a cooler air uh, above the warmer lower layer of the, of the boundary layer, and the boundary layer is more destabilized. Well, in those simulations, if you increase the concentrations of CCN, reduce the drizzle formation process, that actually stabilized the cloud layer. And so you got this response where increasing CCN led to clouds where, which were not as wet and uh, uh, clouds which were actually uh, shorter lived clouds in that, com uh, quite contrary to the simple Albrecht hypothesis in that. Uh, that research also focused on, well, CCN or cloud condensation nuclei aren't, all, aren't the only aerosol we might be concerned about. There's also giant cloud condensation nuclei, which are wettable particles greater than about a micron or so in size and that, that can uh, uh, actually enhance the collision coalescence process in that. Uh, and, and in fact, giant CCN tend to work in opposition to that of enhanced CCN in that. What the, it's not as strong an influence as increased CCN uh, and actually moderates the process. And it, it, it's basically had its biggest impact on polluted clouds. If clouds were low in CCN, 
the warm rain precipitation or drizzle formation process was really fast anyway, and increasing the concentrations of GCSN had a little influence. Uh, another thing that came out of this research and uh, has been elaborated quite a bit more recently by uh, Graham uh, Feingold and that is that if you increase the CCN, it increased the droplet condensation rates and it also increased the evaporation rates in the clouds in that. Again, a more, another nonlinear feedback in that. And that was due to the fact that if you have the same liquid water contents in the cloud and you have more numerous droplets, uh, you have greater surface area for condensation to take place than if you have fewer droplets. So there's greater latent heating from condensation if you enhance CCN concentrations. Conversely, if you have evaporation taking place in the tops of the clouds and that, if you have more numerous droplets that are smaller, more greater surface area exposed to the subsaturated air, you get a greater evaporation and this can lead to enhanced entrainment in the clouds. And, that. and so you get some really, again, interesting nonlinear feedbacks in that. And something that uh, Bjorn Stevens and Graham Feingold have referred to as buffered systems in that. And that, and that, and that feeds back in to cloud top heights and liquid water contents and so forth. A lot of my research is kind of, well, here, here I've been studying, I'm always excited about thunderstorms and that. In fact, mesoscale convective system, I am a student working on aerosol impacts on mesoscale convective systems right now. Uh, and this research was done uh, in collaboration with uh, Sue Vandenheber and Gustavo Cario. Uh, where, first of all, we looked at land use effects. Sue and I, for example, looked at St. Louis and actually went back to data that were acquired, required, acquired during the Metromax field program in the 1970s. I, I took those data there as inputs into the model, got the land use studies from that study, and looked at the combined influence of both land use and, aer and, and uh, aerosol pollution in that area. The so-called the land use effect is what is often called the uh, uh, urban heat island, but it isn't quite as simple as that, really. Um, and what those simulations revealed is that the land use influences in an urban areas, both it turns out in Houston as well as uh, uh, well, I didn't, I, that comes later. I forgot what I had. Uh, that that the, the land use effect actually dominates, I mean, rarely, do, really dominates over any aerosol influence in that. But when we look at the aerosol influence, it tends to invigorate the convection in that. And that's because as we have increased concentrations of CCN, polluted, uh, clean on the left, polluted on the right, uh, suppresses the formation of uh, precipitation particles, these particles are then transported aloft into super cool layers of the cloud, and you get more freezing taking place, more latent heat of freezing, which invigorates the cloud and makes it rain more and produces a colder cold pool. <clears throat> so we find that pollution in that certain conditions can simply intensify downwind convective cells, but uh, however the effect on integral precipitation values is in relatively small. Uh, the, basically, the concept is that higher CCN concentrations reduce the size of droplets, reduce the collision efficiency of the liquid droplets, and increase the amount of supercooled liquid water, and enhances latent heat, re heat release. But the effect is not monotonic. If you get too much pollution, the simulations suggest that this will result in a suppression of the warm cloud collision coalescence process and the ice particle rhyming process to such an extent that you get a lot more water transported up to anvil levels in that. And you actually get a, a reversal or tip over effect where you move from enhanced precipitation with increasing CCN to, uh, a, a, even in some cases, you could actually have a reduction in precipitation with enhanced CCN. Again, nonlinearity, the systems are not quite as simple. Um, some people would lead you to believe that if you have increased CCN in convective clouds, particularly maritime clouds, this will always lead to an increase in precipitation. But Sue Vanden here and I uh, did studies during the, uh, uh, over South Florida where we had a, uh, a dust event move into the area, which increased the concentrations of CCN in the observations, increased the concentrations of giant CCN, 
and increase the concentrations in ice nuclei. So you have opposing effects. Increased CCN should increase the warm cloud collision or decrease the warm cloud collision coalescence process. Increasing giant CCN should, uh, should increase it, and likewise ice nuclei. Am I running out of time? Uh, so, so. Yes. Oh, okay. Pardon? Two seconds. Two seconds. Well, I guess I'll finish that one. I'll go down here. <laughs> I didn't even get into my uh, tropical cyclone. Here we go. So basically, and I'll just put up there that basically the, the, the intent is to show that the variability of CCN has a very nonlinear response. And, it, and the nonlinear response goes over a wide range of clouds from simple stratocumulus clouds to even tropical cyclones. But I didn't talk about that. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Voices. This goes to show you uh, what a full and jam-packed life uh, Bill has led. <laughs> uh, questions? No. The question is, uh, to what extent does Bill think that we understand uh, the processes of precipitation from clouds? Is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, we know it isn't all aerosol. I mean, there's a lot of influences in dynamics of cloud systems that are caused by changes in the environment or shear of the horizontal wind and so forth. And while we kind of understand many of these processes qualitatively, it still is tough when it gets down to quantitative precipitation prediction. Uh, you can see in daily forecasts that we've got a long ways to go in that. But I, I, we've made a, great strides in my 40 years since I've been here. I've learned a lot, not by me directly, but by the community. Top one more question. You can ask him about his tropical cyclones. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Bill. Thank you. Next speaker is Dr. Keen from the University of Virginia. We're coming back to feedbacks. Okay. Well, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here, and I appreciate the uh, audience. Um, first, I'd like to thank my collaborators in this work that I'm going to be presenting today. Uh, it's a talented bunch of people that I had a real privilege to work with, and it's just the tip of the iceberg and people I've uh, had the opportunity to work with over my career. So uh, thank you, folks. Yeah. Okay. Um, we'll start with uh, marine aerosol production. It's initiated by breaking waves, wind waves at the ocean surface, and a portion of the energy dissipated goes into uh, producing, um, pushing air into the surface ocean, which it disaggregates into bubble plumes, rises back to the surface, forms rafts or sometimes individual bubbles, and this is sort of the canonical figure of a bubble bursting, the, the bubble cap disintegrates, uh, we believe producing mostly fine submicron aerosol. Uh, this is dry diameters on the order of 60 nanometers that dominate the number production flux and in many regions of the world, as the uh, in marine regions, is the primary source for uh, particles, uh, submicron particles in the atmosphere. Uh, the cavity collapses, produces a jet, which injects larger droplets in the atmosphere, which are the primary sources for uh, uh, the what we normally think of as sea salt aerosol, the supermicron uh, particles dominated by inorganic sea salt, dry mass diameter on the order of two to three uh, nano, nano, uh, micrometers, excuse me, and uh, uh, dominate uh, the mass flux uh, and volume in Earth's atmosphere. Uh, the production and cycling of these uh, uh, particles is uh, uh, fairly uncertain, and so we uh, decided to build a uh, physical model of uh, the aerosol production system of a break, under a breaking wave so we could understand uh, and deconvolute some of the drivers. This is uh, scaled uh, on the, to the uh, size of the system under uh, uh, investigations, about a meter deep model ocean. We can produce particle of bubbles of different sizes with different size fritz. We can also have jets at the top that uh, uh, inject water on the surface, have fresh flowing seawater through the system, sweep air, uh, relative humidity controlled, which carries the particles to physical sizing and uh, uh, aerosol sampling systems for chemical characterization. 
Uh, we deployed this uh, uh, device on Bermuda twice and on a ship at sea in the, west, in the eastern uh, North Pacific as part of the Calnex program a couple years ago. Uh, these are examples of some of the size distributions, the submicron size distributions that we measured. Um, the uh, light blue scan, our individual size scans, the dark line is the average of each. Uh, in, I think, magenta there is uh, uh, parallel measurements by uh, Tim Bates and Trish Quinn in a, a device that was uh, um, an aerosol, artificial aerosol production device that was uh, deployed over the side of the ship. Uh, the absolute uh, difference is just a function of differential dilution factors, but the relative variability in the size distributions is quite consistent between the two devices, which gives us some confidence that these uh, data are representative. Um, when we bin the submicron and supermicron particles, uh, sum them over uh, the supermicron and submicron size fractions, we see there's a very strong linear correlation between the uh, uh, number production or number concentration or production flux as a function of the bubble rate or the air detrainment rate from the surface ocean um, for both the supermicron and submicron size fractions. We saw similar relationships during both Bermuda and Calnex. And this gives us a tool to estimate the production flux as a function of air detrainment, which we can model as, uh, uh, from the energetics of breaking waves um, as a function of wind velocity. And then we can fit a, size, a shape parameter to the measured production fluxes and uh, yielding a size resolved uh, production uh, flux or number production flux parameterization for the particles, which they can use in, in models. Uh, the other piece of the uh, puzzle here is the uh, organic enrichment of the particles. These are individual uh, size resolved uh, uh, concentrations or enrichment factors, excuse me, of organic carbon in the particles uh, relative to sea salt. Uh, an enrichment factor of one means that the organic carbon would be the same compo composition or ratio to uh, sodium as uh, in seawater. You see the big particles are typically enriched by a factor of 10 to 100, submicron particles by many orders of magnitude. And these submicron particles, which dominate the number of production flux, uh, are typically, uh, on average, about 70% organic dry mass. So when we think of sea salt aerosol production, what we're really talking about is the production of individual particles that are primarily uh, in, uh, composed of organic material. This material is reactive. If you expose it to sunlight, you uh, photobleach, you produce OH, hydrogen peroxide, and, and other reaction products, undoubtedly, that uh, haven't been measured as yet. Um, some estimates of the production flux here uh, uh, suggest that the primary organic production flux associated with sea salt is uh, greater than the secondary organic aerosol production flux from precursors. So it's, it's an enormous flux globally, and we know very little about it. Uh, there's some evidence that, we, uh, that the uh, organic uh, activity in the surface ocean actually affects the physical number of production flux. This, again, is submicron and supermicron uh, production fluxes as a function of chlorophyll A. We, uh, steam through a fairly variable regime of chlorophyll, and we see an inverse correlation between the uh, chlorophyll A concentration um, and the uh, number of production flux of particles. Uh, everything else being the same, the only thing that was changing is the seawater composition, which uh, uh, implies a, uh, uh, an as yet uncharacterized relationship between um, biota and uh, physical aerosol production. Uh, moving on to what uh, the, these particles do when they're in the atmosphere, um, a lot of our work is focused on the inorganic uh, halogen chemistry, and this is a plot of uh, particular bromide deficits as a function of conservative uh, sodium measured in aerosols collected during a cruise in the eastern, north, and south Atlantic from Germany to uh, Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, if there was no uh, dechlorination of the aerosol, you'd see no deficits at all. In fact, we see very large deficits, and this line corresponds to the bromide to sodium ratio in seawater. So you see many of these are approaching 100% debromination. And it was a puzzle for many years why this was happening. And uh, Paul Crutzen and his uh, colleagues at the Max Planck Institute and others basically uh, worked out uh, what we think is the, the chemical scheme. It's initiated by hypobromous acid or hypochlorous acid uh, being scavenged by marine aerosol where it reacts with chloride and bromide to produce BRCL and Br2, which volatilize. And in sunlight, they photolyze to produce chlorine atoms and bromine atoms. Uh, the similar kinds of chemistry uh, happens in the stratosphere where we have uh, these uh, catalytic cycles where bromine reacts with ozone to form BRO and oxygen. BRO reacts with HO2 to form HOBr, which can photolyze. So you get this catalytic uh, ozone destruction cycle in the gas phase. You also have the, uh, H some of the HOBr is taken back up 
and goes back out. And it's called an autocatalytic or an explosion uh, because for every bromine atom that goes in, you get two halogen atoms back out. And so you can rapidly debrominate the aerosol uh, using these types of pathways. I'd like to focus on a couple pathways that haven't received, well, one that hasn't received very much attention, and that's BRO react reacting with NO2 to form uh, bromine nitrates, which then hydrolyze, most of which hydrolyze at the aerosol surfaces to produce nitrate and uh, HOBR. Uh, this pathway, for, for every cycle through, uh, uh, you convert one NOx to nitrate. It accelerates the oxidation of NOx, and it's particularly important in remote marine regions where NOx is low. Uh, the other pathway I'd like to talk about is the, uh, the sulfur pathway, where the hypobromous acids oxidize uh, uh, sulfur-4 in the aerosol solutions to produce sulfur-6. These pathways greatly accelerate the oxidation of sulfur uh, from uh, SO2 to particulate sulfate in pre-existing aerosols and uh, help short-circuit the uh, CLAW hypothesis, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, these are some box model calculations from that same cruise I mentioned earlier, the Polar Stern cruise, which show the conventional Hox-Nox photochemistry dominated by gas phase Nox sinks in the polluted European regime, the relatively uh, less polluted North Africa, the intertropical convergence zone, and the um, South Atlantic. Um, when, this is with no halogen chemistry now, the conventional Hox-Nox photochemistry. If we kick on the halogen chemistry in the simulations, we see a fundamental change in the Nox sinks where we have uh, dominant in the cleaner regimes, which are dominated by heterogeneous uh, destruction uh, primarily by uh, uh, the production and uh, processing of um, halogen nitrates. We've taken this chemistry, the, the MECA chemical scheme that the Max Planck Institute has uh, uh, led the development of and uh, embedded it in the community atmosphere model. And this is a, uh, a work of Mike Long, now a postdoc at Harvard and a former student at UVA, uh, some of his dissertation research. And this is looking at the percent deviation of a average annual NOx uh, in the planetary boundary layer, uh, comparing with halogens relative to no halogens. And so uh, it's halogens minus no halogens divided by no halogens. So 50 percent, uh, factor two reduction is a 50 percent uh, percent deviation. And what you see is these large cool regions over most of Earth's oceans uh, showing a significant reduction in the NOx concentration in the presence of halogens, uh, often by factor two or more. Another interesting feature here is, uh, was a focus of a number of uh, papers earlier in the, in the week looking at this, this uh, actual enhancement in NOx over the ocean is a, a driven by the production of ClNO2 at night, which is the NOx reservoir species, and it uh, allows NOx to be transported over the ocean uh, before it's uh, 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 fertilized during the daytime. Um, another feature of the system is the uh, marine aerosol and associated sulfur chemistry uh, is a major short circuit in the CLAW hypothesis. Uh, most of you are aware of that. The, uh, uh, introduced by Bob Charlson and uh, uh, co workers in 1987, a provocative uh, a hypothesis stimulated a huge amount of good work, and uh, uh, many of us now think it's uh, probably not right. But the, uh, basically, it's phy phytoplankton uh, producing DMS emitted to the atmosphere. The DMS is oxidized to SO2 and then on to sulfuric acid and produces sulfur aerosol, which grow into CCN size, uh, impacts cloud albedo, slows radio of transfer, and which impacts the uh, phytoplankton. Um, when you add marine aerosol to this system, uh, it changes, changes the sulfur cycle fundamentally. Um, you produce a BRO and CL, as I mentioned, and that um, accelerates the oxidation of DMS. Uh, SO2 is taken up in the aerosol, oxidized by hypohalous acids. So it's really the marine aerosol that dominates the CCN. You basically short circuit this uh, uh, SO2 to, to sulfur aerosol. And this is a plot of the percent deviations of DMS globally with halogen chemistry. And you can, again, see a, a large negative uh, 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 deviation associated with the uh, accelerated oxidation of DMS, primarily by BRO. So there's a number of important outstanding questions. Uh, uh, the uh, production flux is really a function of sea state rather than wind velocity. Um, the influence of seawater composition on the size result number of production flux and the organic enrichment. The role of these primary organics in, in atmospheric chemistry. The influences of halogen radical uh, chemistry on ozone and also the accelerated oxidation of NOx and indirect destruction of ozone and uh, OH and the impacts on sulfur chemistry. And I'd like to close by thanking the funding agencies who have supported this work, primarily the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy. So thank you. Thank you. If you have questions.
one or two. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Take your stuff. Our next speaker is uh, uh, from an uh, AGU perspective and also from many other perspectives a very uh, uh, interesting chap. Um, uh, when you go to a Broadway play, you, you see the actors or the dancers or whatever it might be, and you think, oh, that was good. But uh, it's the people behind the scenes that are very, very important. And, and I think of all the people I know in the American Geophysical Union, Alan has played an absolutely stunning um, role in especially atmospheric sciences, but in the council. And uh, all, many of the changes that you see are taking place in the AG right now are, are due to, to Alan. He's done uh, stellar work uh, all the way from nuclear conflict, which we'll talk about today, to the role of volcanism in climate. So, um, and by the way, uh, this is like a, a wedding rehearsal. Uh, he's, he's dressing up to practice what it would be like to receive his prize tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Peter. This is a great honor to be here. I'd also like to thank AGU, all the colleagues and students who I've worked with, and the American taxpayer for funding my work. This, is also, this talk is also going to be in the theme of science and society and impacts of science on, uh, on policy. You want to start the clock? So this is our beautiful planet, but after a nuclear war, it might look like this, with a cloud of smoke covering the planet, absorbing the sunlight, and making it cold and dark and dry at the Earth's surface. The theory of nuclear winter is very simple. Uh, there would be targets that would be cities or ground bursts, which would produce smoke or dust, which would absorb or reflect sunlight, meaning very little sunlight would reach the ground, and it would rapidly cool. And this is what we call nuclear winter. And if there was enough, it could cause devastation for agriculture and a catastrophe for humankind. This is a graph of the number of nuclear warheads on the planet, and work uh, done by, jointly by Soviet and American scientists in the early 1990s gave the same message to policymakers that this would be a catastrophe. And then I wrote a paper the next year in Nature along with Steve Schneider's group. Uh, Turco et al, by the way, includes Tom Ackerman who's here and who just gave a talk and Brian Toon who's here. And then the nuclear arms race ended and the number of weapons started going down. And it wasn't caused by the end of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union didn't end till here. You also might note that the, is this the pointer? That the number of nuclear weapons during the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962 was almost exactly the same as it is today. But back then we didn't know that it would produce a nuclear winter. Why do I think that the, this work, this message from scientists helped to end the arms race? Well, you can ask Mikhail Gorbachev. He was interviewed in 1994. How did he feel when he got control of the Soviet nuclear arsenal? He said, perhaps there was an emotional side to it, but it was rectified by my knowledge of the might that had been accumulated. One thousandth of this might was enough to destroy all living things on Earth, and I knew the report on nuclear winter. And in a 2000 interview, he said, models made by American, Russian and American scientists showed that a nuclear war would result in a nuclear winter that would be extremely destructive to all life on Earth. The knowledge of that was a great stimulus to us, to people of honor and morality, to, to act in that situation. The work I'm going to talk about is, is the most important work I've done in my life and what I've done a lot of in the next five years. And these are the colleagues that work with me on it. Luke Oman, Gira Stanchikov, Brian Toon, Chuck Bardeen, Rich Turco, and Lily Schott. This is a graph of the number of nuclear weapons on the planet as a function of time. And you can see it, this red line is one new country for every five years, and uh, there are nine nuclear uh, nations on the planet, and it's more than just these established nuclear powers. At an AGU meeting here uh, six years ago now, Brian and, and Rich rocked up to me and said, we we're calculating how much smoke would come from a war between India and Pakistan using much less than 1% of the global nuclear arsenal. And Luke and I then did climate model simulations of that. Here's a, uh, uh, the number of weapons on the planet. And the Russia and the U.S. still have about 10,000 each. If you look at how much smoke would be generated by dropping 50 Hiroshima-sized weapons on the major targets in different countries, this is how much smoke 
uh, millions of tons of, of black carbon. And these are the nuclear weapon states. And so we did a model. We took this amount of smoke from India and Pakistan and put it into the model. We actually were conservative. We used five teragrams of smoke. Uh, it would be a terrible tragedy. 20 million people would die. And, but there would be smoke injected into the upper troposphere actually, actually, actually after accounting for fuel loading and emission factors rain out. And we used the GIS uh, GCM, Dorothy Koch's uh, rate, uh, code for aerosols. And here's a, a movie of where the smoke would go. And it would, this is from one of the runs that we did, it would spread around the world. Within a week or so, most of the planet would be covered. I'm going to show this again, and on the left I'll have a graph of the vertical distribution. And you can see that it gets lofted up above the tropopause within two or three days, and it ends up with an e-folding lifetime of about five years, much longer than for volcanic aerosols, which have a lifetime of only about one year. And so we calculated the climate response. This is the global average temperature response, and temperatures would go down by about one and a quarter degrees Celsius for several years. This is with a coupled atmosphere ocean GCM. And the forcing at the bottom, the blue line is for a Pinatubo simulation, and the black is for this. So the forcing would be much larger and last for much longer. And the, on the black on the right is precipitation. Uh, global precipitation would go down about 10%. So this would not be a nuclear winter, but it turns out it, it would be, if you plot it now on the curve we know and love of global warming, it would plummet us much colder than little ice age conditions very quickly. This would be global climate change unprecedented in recorded human history. If you put it on the hockey stick diagram, it would be colder than the little ice age. The upper atmosphere would be heated, and this is the change in temperature of the uh, atmosphere of more than 50 degrees Celsius warming, and of course this would have an influence on stratospheric chemistry. And this is results of Mike Mills, who's here, and Brian Toon, uh, showing that for this case, for India-Pakistan nuclear war, much less than 1% of the nuclear arsenal, you would reduce ozone globally to, new, to ozone hole levels for, for years. And Mike's done some recent work that shows the effects of even larger in temperature than I showed you just here if you account for the ozone feedback. If you look at the spatial distribution of temperature, the cooling would be larger over the land in the summertime, several degrees. The ocean wouldn't cool as fast. And precipitation would go down. And so we said, well, and the growing season would be shorter by several weeks. So we, we decided to look, this is very recent work just submitted to climatic change. How would this affect agriculture? So I worked with Mutlu Ozdogan and we put these scenarios of, of this change of temperature, precipitation, and sunlight into a model that calculates the productivity of corn and soybeans in the Midwest United States. And the productivity would go down by about 15 to 20 percent for a decade. This is corn, this is soybeans. So our source of food is the grocery store, and if people stopped trading food, it would be a real catastrophe, not just the immediate effect, but the effect on trade. And then Lily and I did a study where we looked at rice production in China with a different agricultural model, and for the first three years, there would be a 25% reduction of rice production in China, and averaged over the 10 years, about a 15% reduction of rice. We took this new good model and we said, let's go back and do a calculation of nuclear winter. Back in the day, there was always a question, was it nuclear fall, was it nuclear winter? And so we did the simulation with 150 teragrams of smoke, which was the baseline simulation back then. But it's also what could be produced today, because then we had to use nine weapons on every target because they ran out of, we out of targets. And this is a simulation of where the smoke would go. And for 150 teragrams of smoke, and the temperature change would be huge. This is the change in the first year, and let's look at the, at the Ukraine, and the red line, the black line is the normal seasonal cycle from the control run. The red is what you would get after this uh, 150 teragrams, and indeed, the temperatures would go below freezing for more than two years. So really, it is nuclear winter in the middle of continents. And we did a, a scenario for 50 teragrams, and this is the 5 teragram one I showed you. It's very nonlinear because once you get a lot of smoke, there's not much sunlight to, to uh, reflect back, to, to stop. 
you plot these five, three curves on the global warming, this is how much temperature change you would get, or on the hockey stick diagram. And we can still produce this with our current arsenal, and the arsenal by the end of the New START Treaty will still be able to produce nuclear winter. So what's new? A nuclear war between new nuclear states using much less than 1% of the current nu nuclear arsenal could produce climate change unprecedented in human history. Nuclear winter theory was correct. The current arsenal can still produce nuclear winter. And the effects of a regional or global nuclear war would last for more than a decade. We never knew that before. We only did that, knew that by running a model with a, a stratosphere and mesosphere. There are many analogs, which I don't have time to talk about, uh, that, that uh, we can't test this theory in the real world, so we can look at, at day and night, the seasonal cycle, fires, and smoke and dust, and volcanic eruptions as analogs. So uh, Obama and Medvedev signed the New START Treaty last year in April, pledging us to go down to about 4,000 weapons total by, uh, by 20, 2017. But as Carl Sagan said, elementary planetary hygiene demands many fewer nuclear weapons much more quickly than this that will still be at danger even with that reduced number. So a year ago, I was invited to go to Cuba. Fidel Castro became interested in my work, and I gave an hour-long talk on nuclear winter with him sitting in the front row, and that's his signature of the, the photo that he gave me. And then he presented me with his, his uh, biography, the autobiography, which he'd just uh, written. And then the next day at the Hotel Nacional, this envelope showed up from Commander-in-Chief Fidel Castro Ruz for me with a photo uh, uh, that was taken, signed by him. And so uh, I'm going to Cuba. I'm going to, what's that? I'm going to Cuba next week on a trip sponsored by AAAS, and I'm going to talk to them about having a conference in October there, the 50th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis, and we'll invite all the foreign ministers of the nuclear nations and explain to them that you've got to get rid of the nuclear weapons much more quickly than we're doing now to save the planet from this danger. And I hope that this will work. You'll find out about it next year and uh, keep our planet looking as uh, Oh, and, and after I talked to Fidel, th nine days later, he said, while the United States and Russia each committed to reducing their operative nuclear arsenals down to some 2,000 weapons in April 2010 in Prague, the only way to prevent a global climate catastrophe from taking place would be by eliminating nuclear weapons. And I hope the rest of the world will agree to this soon. Thanks. Well, I hope it's more successful than the reduction of greenhouse gases. Yeah. <laughs> uh, questions? I think that was a marvelous talk. Thanks. Is it your first slide? Yes. Uh, that's not the first slide, but yes, there we okay. go. That's it. All right. So Dr. Um, <coughs> Paul Shepson, and we back. Oh, it's wrong one. That's good. All right. And we go back to the climate change. OK. Hi, it's a very full room. I should endeavor to be not terrible. Um, so I want to uh, thank you very much for this fantastic honor. It's very humbling to be recognized in this way by your colleagues who are smarter than you are and <clears throat> you know who you are. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, work that I've done uh, 
in the Arctic since I became an, an AGU member in the 1980s. Some of the data will be more recent than that, though not all of it. Uh, curiously, a, a lot of the climate change that I'll be discussing occurred since the time that I started flying to San Francisco every year. Um, so um, I'm going to be talking about atmospheric chemistry uh, and uh, what's important to understand about atmospheric chemistry is the troposphere performs a very important cleaning function. For us, it converts non-water soluble volatile compounds to water soluble less volatile products and it does that through the hydroxyl radical that's produced um, from the photolysis of ozone in the presence of water vapor. But not so much in the Arctic, because in the Arctic there's relatively less sunlight, there's relatively less uh, tropospheric ozone, and there's a lot less water vapor. So the Arctic, if you want to think of it this way, would, would be happy if there were another mechanism for self-cleaning. Such a mechanism was discovered in the 1980s by a couple different groups, by Jan Bottenheim and colleagues in Environment Canada and by Sam Oldmans and, and colleagues at, at NOAA, um, who observed that ozone at ground level in the springtime in the Arctic occasionally undergoes rapid and sometimes complete uh, depletion, and this was a very big surprise. It has uh, now been found that these depletions are quite common all around the Arctic. This is color-coded ozone. This is from a series of ozone sun launches from Sam Altman's and Brian Johnson at, at NOAA during Oasis 2009 and Barrow. So color-coded uh, hot is, this is sort of background ozone. You see that ozone can be completely depleted. This is about zero here, up to about 400 meters. Because ozone depletion in the Arctic occurs in the springtime simultaneous with Arctic haze, that is a dramatic increase in fine aerosol, an examination of correlations between ozone and the composition of that aerosol led to the discovery by Len Berry and colleagues that when ozone undergoes rapid depletion, there's a dramatic increase in bromine in the fine aerosol. So it looks like some chemistry in the gas phase was converting bromine into products that then attaches to the aerosol. The hypothesis that was formulated at that time, as Bill Keane uh, described a little bit, is that bromine atoms, if you can make them, react with ozone, making a free radical BRO that can react with itself, giving you back bromine atoms. This little chain can spin around many times until you have destroyed all of the ozone at ground level. The bromine atoms can terminate the chain by reacting with something like formaldehyde to make HBr that then sticks to the particles, accounting for this inverse correlation. Then, um, during the Polar Sunrise Experiment 1992 at Alert at the tip of Ellesmere Island in the Canadian archipelago, Tom Jobson and Hiromi Niki from York University showed from looking at hydrocarbon decays that the kinetics of hydrocarbon decay is consistent with chlorine atom chemistry and that, that they then discovered at that time that there is very dramatic and very active chlorine atom chemistry in the Arctic in the springtime. At the same time, Len Berry uh, and colleagues from Environment Canada found that there is also quite active iodine chemistry. Uh, so this is a plot of the relative amounts of iodine and bromine in the fine aerosol. Uh, typically, with a ratio of 20 to 1, bromine over iodine, while in seawater, it's more like 1,500 to 1. So there has to be some mechanism for putting iodine atoms in the gas phase and then converting them to something like HI or HOI that goes into the aerosol. So we now know that there is very active Chlorine, bromine, and iodine chemistry in the Arctic, that's very unusual. They all react rapidly with ozone. Chlorine is a very non-discriminatory uh, atom. It reacts with just about everything it, it collides with. A few years later, the group at Bremen, Andreas Richter and colleagues, showed from satellite measurements that you can see the BRO from space. 
Uh, so this is from the GOM satellite instrument. The hot color means relatively more column BRO that, that we often see around the Canadian archipelago, and we're still trying to figure that out. Back in 1998, Bill Schroeder and colleagues from Environment Canada found that elemental mercury that normally has a very long lifetime of about a year in the atmosphere is rapidly consumed in the Arctic, converted to products that can precipitate out into the, to the sensitive uh, ecosystem at the surface. That happens simultaneously with ozone depletion in the springtime. So uh, this 10-year period of very rapid discovery led to uh, lots of people worldwide being interested in asking fundamental science questions about what's going on here because it's quite unusual. First, what chemistry initiates the oxidation of chloride and bromide that presumably start with sea salt to the molecular halogens that have been observed as precursors to halogen atoms? Where is that activation occurring physically? That is, is it at the saline cryosphere surface or does it occur on the surface of aerosols that, that originally derive from the surface? And then what is oxidizing uh, mercury has become uh, an important question. That is, is it halogen compounds that are oxidizing mercury? So the first hypothesis about what is oxidizing the halide ions from the surface came from Fan and Jacob in 92, the hypothesis being that HOBr produced from some gas phase chemistry can oxidize bromide in sea salt aerosol in the presence of acidity to make Br2, that being non-water soluble and it comes off into the gas phase. Br2 uh, has since been detected uh, in the snowpack and in the atmosphere. Recently at Barrow, Alaska, from the OASIS 2009 campaign, HOBR was measured for the first time by Jin Lau and Greg Huey at Georgia Tech. And what, this is 24-hour uh, average uh, data for the campaign. And what they saw is when HOBR goes away uh, in the evening after the sun comes down, you start seeing BR2 build up. So we think we understand some of the bromine part of it, and it sort of goes like this. I'll go quickly because Bill also described this. Ozone reacts at the saline surface, and you make HOBR that then oxidizes bromide. You get BR2 coming out that photolyzes, destroys two ozones, and makes BRO that you can see from satellites. That BRO reacts with HO2 and you make HOBr, and if that collides with the saline surface. Now two bromine atoms go in and you get four bromine atoms coming out in the form of Br2. They photolyze uh, again and you make HOBr, and so you get an exponential draw out of bromine from the surface, and you can destroy all of the ozone at the surface. In 2007, uh, Tackett et al. from Purdue showed that the chlorine chemistry that is occurring at Barrow occurs in a very shallow layer near the surface, making us think this is a, a, a surface-focused uh, process. But yet from 2009 at Barrow, from the Oasis 09 campaign, uh, DOAS measurements showed that uh, where, when ozone is depleted, so this is altitude, potential temperature, ozone, BRO, and aerosol optical depth, you some... I've lost my screen. <laughs> Can I have my screen back? <laughs> Did the clock stop? Yes, we have a good job. It's good. I might sneak a few more minutes in. Wow, it's already yellow. Got the uh, okay. Um, so it looks like this halogen chemistry can also be activated on aerosol. And um, so this is ongoing research. We think we've understood, we've answered the question of what is oxidizing mercury. It's bromine atoms, um, which is more important than BRO, but uh, bromine chemistry is oxidizing mercury, and there are important questions about how that might be happening uh, worldwide. So an important question we now have, and uh, 
which is intriguing and we should be asking is, what will the future bring? And the reason for that is, as we know, climate is changing at a rate that's maybe two times faster in the Arctic uh, than it is globally. Uh, this is a plot from the APL lab at University of Washington that shows sea ice volume versus month. This is the, the climatological average for the period 79 through 2010. And then here are the three of the most recent years, the big surprise from 2007. The light blue is 2010, and then the darker blue is the recent year, which is a record low in terms of sea ice volume. So Arctic sea ice, because of climate change, is being converted from a multi-year pack, which is relatively less saline, to a first-year sea ice, which is much more saline, which will, as long as there is sea ice, accelerate this chemistry. Uh, that uh, sea ice change causes the well-known uh, sea ice albedo uh, Arctic amplification, but it is actually the case that much of the ar Arctic amplification is probably caused by increased cloud cover and increased downwelling uh, long-wave radiation. The Arctic is greening. This is NDVI, where you have uh, big uh, losses in sea ice cover. So biology in the Arctic is going to change dramatically. I have to go quickly here. So this is, is a plot of uh, the log of, of conductivity of the surface for first-year ice and multi-year ice. This is a log scale. So the Arctic surface is becoming much more saline. And again, as, as long as we continue to have sea ice, for a few decades or so, this chemistry will, will likely accelerate. So it's very important for us to be able to make observations of how the Arctic environment is changing because of the very unique chemistry and now biology that, that is occurring and changing. Uh, so what do we need? We need a much better ability to make observations. We're quite good from satellites. But uh, in situ observations in the, uh, at the Arctic Ocean surface is extremely challenging. Uh, so I want to thank all who, uh, who have helped me get to this point. Uh, I, we all do our work on the backs of colleagues and students, so I thank my students. NSF has been extremely supportive of all of the research in, in the Arctic, and I thank my colleagues from OASIS. Oh, we have a question. Do you have a questions? Yes, please. Can, can this happen on snow or does it have to be ice? <clears throat> we know from observations uh, in coastal environments that these molecular halogens that are produced are coming out of saline snowpack. So if it's snow that, it, it, that is in, in uh, polar coastal environments, th this chemistry is quite active. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Okay. While the speaker is getting ready, just to remind you that this evening is the awards ceremony, uh, seven o'clock for those who want to. Uh, be part of it, but not getting awards. And I'm told by Brian Toon there's a practice at four o'clock in the morning. Uh, sorry, four o'clock in. The <laughs> it's three o'clock. Okay, well, three o'clock you practice, but. Uh, we have a on dinner tomorrow. Hmm? We have on dinner tomorrow. Yes, and the, and the dinner tomorrow night. Yeah. Okay. So um, we're staying with the chemistry. And um, Dr. Goldstein will um, report us his research in the, um, about the VOCs and in, in the California state. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm really honored and humbled to be here. Uh, I, I want to start just by thanking all my mentors, all the members of my research group, um, past and present, and all the uh, great colleagues that I've had a chance to work with over the years that. Uh, have gotten me here. I, I see that accounts for probably half the people in the room. I thank you for being here. Um, so I, I also um, 
want to say that I'm not ready to do a retrospective, so I am only going to talk about new stuff. <laughs> I'm only going to show you things that we've been working on recently, and uh, we've been looking at new observations of VOC emissions concentrations uh, above and around the Central Valley of California. In this map, you can see where the Central Valley is. This is a topo map of California. Um, that Central Valley is, is full of agricultural activities. Surrounding the Central Valley are foothills and then mountains. In the foothills, we've got oak trees. Uh, when we get further up into the mountains, we have a lot of pine trees. And those are the kinds of sources of VOC that I'm really going to focus on today. I'm going to be presenting work that really is produced by my research group and collaborators, so I thank them. And I'll acknowledge up front the California Resources Board funded most of the work I'll show you today. Uh, um, also, uh, the Citrus Research Board funded some of it, so thank them. Okay, so just a little introduction. Anthropogenic versus biogenic volatile organic compounds. There's about 100 teragrams of carbon per year emitted as anthropogenic VOCs from a variety of sources. Um, the biogenic VOC emissions are about 10 times that on a global basis. Almost half the biogenic VOC emissions are thought to be isoprene. Then there's a whole bunch of other VOCs that OVOC has sometimes been changed to, uh, into oxygenated VOCs. It depends on which paper you read. Um, then other reactive VOCs, terpenes, sesquiterpenes. Um, and I think we're mostly still sticking with the numbers that Alex Gunther published back in 1995, but about 1,100 teragrams. So globally, we have about 10 times as much uh, biogenic VOC as anthropogenic VOC. One of the questions that we're grappling with is in the Central Valley of California, what's the relative contribution of anthropogenic and biogenic VOCs? It's poorly constrained. So why do we care? Um, this figure shows the days exceeding the U.S. eight-hour ozone standard uh, for three areas. One's the South Coast Air Basin um, here. Uh, one is the San Joaquin Valley, and the other is the San Francisco Bay Area. So you should be very thankful ADU plans their meetings in San Francisco each year. You can see this is a really good place to breathe the air in comparison to some other spots in California. Um, not even a chuckle? Come on. All right. So, so thank you. Um, so uh, notice that the... San Joaquin Valley um, hasn't really been improving nearly as much as the other areas around California. So um, we, we've seen already uh, in this session the basics that VOC and NOx together with sunlight make ozone, they make particles. So um, why is the San Joaquin Valley different? That's the question we're going to ask. And the angle, there are a lot of people asking this question right now in the context of the Calnex campaign. Um, I'm not going to show any Calnex data today, but I'll show some data that, that uh, uh, enhance our understanding from other studies. And really, we'll be looking at VOC sources. OK. So we did three recent field campaigns focused on biogenic VOC emissions in my group. This map is showing um, the Megan modeled isoprene emissions for California. It basically shows you where the oak trees are. So that's where we think the isoprene emissions are. Uh, they're, the first of these studies I'll talk about uh, was done in a citrus orchard right here in the heart of the Central Valley. This is all agricultural land. Um, and more generally, we're going to be looking at a little bit of crop emissions that occur on the valley floor. Then we did an aircraft study uh, on the surface twin otter last summer um, uh, in collaboration with folks at NCAR. Uh, we called it Cabernet. And we, we really focused on the oak foothills, but we did several transects across the valley as well, but really you can see that we tried to cover the areas where the oaks are, and we measured concentrations and fluxes, so I'll be talking about that. And then uh, also uh, last summer, uh, we got some data on a tall tower that's right in the center of the Central Valley. You might have seen Mark Fisher talk about data from the Walnut Grove Tower earlier in terms of greenhouse gases, um, but this is a, a tower that integrates over a large area of the valley. And um, it's 525 meters tall, so it's often sticking up above the inversion layer. Um, so we can get some really nice vertical profiles there. So first, the agricultural crops. Um, in the first phase, what we did is we, we took um, all the major crop species in California. We grew them in greenhouse. We put um, uh, branch enclosures around them, and we measured their biogenic VOC emissions. The basic results are that agricultural crops are low biogenic VOC emitters compared to the oak and pine trees, which dominate the mountains surrounding the valley. But what they do emit is mainly methanol, 
terpenes, acetone, acetaldehyde, and small amounts of other VOC. There's almost no isoprene emitted. Now that's really important because isoprene is the major biogenic VOC that's uh, involved in the ozone production in this region. Um, we now have uh, model emission factors that can be used um, in BVOC models for crops, uh, all these different crops, and uh, that's, that is available now. Um, so for phase two, we focused on what, what was the uh, most important of those crops. It turned out that citrus emitted more than most of the other um, types of crops that we looked at, and when you combine that with uh, their planting distribution, we decided to focus a full year campaign in an orange orchard, and you can see the tower site right here. Um, the orange orchard is very regularly spaced. The trees are every 20 feet. Um, it's a great place to do biosphere atmosphere flux measurements because it's such an even surface to work over. Uh, we set up this field site, and there are three basic kinds of measurements that I'll be talking about. One is that we did uh, PTRMS measurements for a full year. That's proton transfer reaction mass spectrometry. spectrometry and we looked at fluxes of methanol, acetone, isoprene, and terpenes. And we did vertical gradients for about 20 different masses. And then uh, we borrowed a PTR TOF MS, a time of flight mass spec from Rupert Holzinger, who I see in the audience. Um, and we uh, did one month of concentration of flux measurements. And the difference between these is that with the quadrupole mass spec, you get unit mass resolution, and you can only look at a few masses at a time. With the time of flight mass spec, you get high mass resolution, you get to see the whole spectrum all the time, and we saw 666 different masses that we could actually identify. 93 of them had significant flux, so we'll be talking about that a little bit. And then we had an in situ GC MS FID in the spring and summer campaigns uh, to do um, detailed VOC speciation. So what do the data look like? This is the full year of flux measurements measured with the PTRMS. A um, couple key features. One, there's pretty much no isoprene emissions. Um, the dominant emissions were methanol and monoterpenes with a fair amount of acetone. And the emissions uh, were generally low, but during certain periods they went way up. In particular, the flowering period it went way up. When you go out in the springtime in the Central Valley and all the trees are flowering, it is gorgeous. They're, they're, uh, you can see uh, just fields and fields of flowers and you smell it. It's very aromatic, very strong, and that's the kind of things that we're measuring. Um, it's a beautiful site. I invite you to come back next spring. Um, also, when we're harvesting and trimming, we saw uh, extra emissions, and maybe a little bit during the fertilizer application as well. So taking a more detailed look at what happened in flowering with the GCMS measurements that were made by uh, Drew Gentner, and he'll be talking a little bit about some of this in, in his uh, talk on Friday. Uh, but he'll be focusing more on the anthropogenic VOC emissions that we saw during Calnex, actually, and a few other campaigns. So during spring flowering, um, notice that the scale here goes up to 30 ppb. Um, during the summer, more typical conditions, scale goes up to 5 ppb. There's a lot more terpenoid compounds out there during flowering, and there's a very different mixture. So uh, sabinine and uh, beta myrcene were dominant compounds. Uh, during the flowering, but during most of the year, it was limonene that was the dominant compound. So flowering really changes the chemistry in terms of emissions and composition. When we start looking in more detail with the time of flight mass spec, things get more complicated. So this is uh, going to be shown in much more detail in a talk by uh, Jung Hu Park on Friday. Um, but basically, there were 93 masses that showed significant fluxes. Um, they're listed here in case you're curious. Um, these are exact masses, so we actually have the chemical formula for each of these compounds. And if you look at the total flux, um, there's actually some compounds that deposit. That's below zero. Most of the compounds are emitted. Um, and 16% of the emission was monoterpene, 15% methanol, 11% acetone, 10% acetic acid, and about half is actually all these other compounds. So there really is a lot of complexity to the biogenic VOC emissions, and very little of this is in the regional ozone and, and uh, photochemistry uh, models for uh, aerosol production as well. Okay. Now, to get a broader perspective, we did a campaign in June 2011. Uh, we called it Cabernet, California Airborne Biogenic VOC Emission Research in Natural Ecosystem Transects. We were really focusing on the oaks. So the reason that we called it Cabernet wasn't just because this made sense. It was really, uh, I, I love uh, 
wine and I make wine, and one of the things that, that you do with wine as soon as like a Cabernet is you put it in an oak barrel. So there's a connection between these isoprene emissions and how we age and make our Cabernet in this state better. I hope you'll enjoy some Cabernet while you're here. Um, so we had seven. Oh, we had seven flight hours, and I have two minutes. Um, so um, we, we did PTRMS flux measurements. There's a great team from NCAR involved in this as well. You can see that um, we, we did mixing ratios and fluxes. Um, this is an example where we did racetracks, and we could measure the flux instantaneously and on these 15-kilometer legs, and we saw that it declined with altitude, and once we got above the boundary layer, there's basically none left. Um, the isoprene was low over the valley, high over the foothills, where the oaks are. It made sense. Um, the dominant emission was from the oaks, not from the valley. Uh, you could see the same pattern in MVK methacolin. I'm going to go fast here because they're going to make me stop. Um, methanol, you could see a similar pattern, except there are real hot spots for methanol over the dairies, and they, they correlate beautifully with methane. So we know that dairies and crops and the forests are all good sources for methanol. So one last piece that I'm going to talk about is that we made measurements on this tall tower right in the middle of the Central Valley. There's daytime upslope flow, nighttime downslope flow. So daytime and nighttime look really different. Um, OK, in the interest of time, I'm just going to say this very quickly. Um, we can see that there's a stable inversion layer uh, based on the potential temperature that happens all night. And you get mixing during the day. And then the inversion layer happens again here. Right when the inversion layer sets in in the late afternoon, you see spikes in isoprene concentration. But when you see the most biogenic VOC concentrations over the valley, it's actually at night when the air is coming back down from the hills surrounding the valley. And you see very high methyl vinyl ketone and methacrylene levels, not at the surface, but above the surface. Uh, put on a um, contour plot, um, this is height, this is hour of day and the colors indicate concentration. You can see the isoprene is just stuck at the surface. When we flew over, we were flying at this height in the middle of the day. We didn't see this. When we flew over, we were flying at this height during the middle of the day. We didn't see the MVK of methacrylene. But when we, we sit in the middle of the valley and you look at the vertical profiles, you can see that the airspace above about 200, 250 meters fills every night with these oxidation products and they mix down to the surface in the morning. So we think a lot of the biogenic VOC contribution to the chemistry in the valley is actually through this mechanism. Um, and you can also see that uh, the potential temperature uh, is very related to when you see high and low ozone. Um, I will stop there. And I will thank you very much for your attention, for sticking around this late into lunch. Thank you. Uh, do you have any questions? I have a question. Okay. Is urban planners working with, with you? Who? Urban planning? Oh, urban planning people. Uh, no, not directly. We're working more directly with the uh, uh, Air Resources Board. Okay. Other questions? All right, thank you.